this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on today's video. On today's video, we're in session number three of our new series entitled Instability Syndromes and the AMA Guides. And today we're going to be finishing up our discussion of the upper extremity instabilities. In session number one, we talked about shoulder instabilities. In our last session, we talked about elbow instabilities. And today we're going to finish up with a more lengthy and more elaborate discussion on a more common condition involving the wrist, which are described in the AMA guides as the carpal instabilities. So carpal instabilities are fascinating. Most of the carpal instability patterns that are described, at least in the AMA guides, are the result of a common industrial injury mechanism of injury, which involves a fall onto an outstretched hand also known as the FOSH, F-O-O-S-H, fall on an outstretched hand. And a fall on an outstretched hand can happen in any number of possible scenarios where a person can fall off of a step, they can fall off of simply trip at ground level and land on their outstretched hand, they can fall from a loading dock down to the ground below on an outstretched hand, and the number of possible scenarios that involve a fall on an outstretched hand are limited only by the imagination, really. So this is a common uh, injury that occurs in the industrial setting, and these carpal instability patterns frequently result uh, from this mechanism of injury. Now, it's interesting, if you uh, do some research in the literature under carpal instabilities, you'll find that like elbow instabilities and like shoulder instabilities, the literature still is not settled on a classification system for describing the various instabilities situations that can occur at the wrist. Much as uh, we talked about in the elbow, the carpal instability patterns uh, have many different classification systems. Well, the AMA guides selects one of the classification systems and, uh, and uh, fashions its permanent impairment ratings around findings within this classification system. So to be a little bit clearer, the AMA guides describe two types of carpal instability patterns. Number one, the dissociative carpal instability patterns, and number two is the non-dissociative carpal instability patterns. Whereas dissociative instability patterns involve disruptions between bones of the same carpal row, so this would be a disruption between bones. Ordinarily, these bones are associated and move coordinatedly and are held together by thick intraosseous ligaments, which when they become injured, become dissociated. And then the second pattern is the non-dissociative carpal instability patterns, which describes a disruption in the relationship between carpal bones not in the same carpal row as is described by the dissociative carpal instability patterns, but rather describes disruptions in relationships of carpal bones in adjacent carpal rows, such as between the proximal carpal row and the distal carpal row, or between the more proximal radius and ulna and the first row of carpal bones. So the AMA guides give us uh, several opportunities within this classification to discover examinees who have either a dissociative or a non-dissociative carpal instability pattern. And the AMA guides provides for a permanent impairment rating for this type of an injury, which likely is permanent, likely will never, uh, never get well, and will likely always leave the examinee with some functional limitation uh, with activities of daily living. So this is a lengthy discussion. In today's session, we're gonna go into the dissociative carpal instability patterns. And in our very next session, we'll finish up uh, with a discussion of the non-dissociative carpal instability patterns. And it's my opinion and my experience that you're gonna encounter examinees more commonly who have a non-dissociative carpal instability pattern. The AMA guides require, require a alteration in x-ray findings in order to describe a dissociative 
carpal instability pattern, well, many of the examinees who have these wrist injuries will not have alterations in their x-ray measurements and angles. In other words, they won't qualify for a dissociative carpal instability impairment rating but they will still qualify for an impairment rating due to non-dissociative carpal instability pattern. So we're gonna describe uh, both of these types of instability patterns, beginning today with the dissociative carpal instability patterns. Okay, so let's begin and um, let's uh, first start off by talking about uh, what a couple of references uh, have to say about uh, the different classification systems and the different definitions that apply to the generic term that we refer to when we talk about carpal instability. Okay, so according to a study published in 2015 in the journal Hand Clinician, uh, talking about carpal ligament injuries, the pathomechanics of injuries to the carpal ligaments, and the classification of carpal instabilities, they begin by uh, defining carpal instability by stating that carpal instability exists when the wrist is unable to maintain its normal alignment as it moves through its motion arc under physiologic loads. So this brings up the topic that the wrist has normal and established movement patterns as it goes through its normal ranges of motion, which include flexion, extension, radial and ulnar deviation, and of course 100 combinations of all of those movements. So as the wrist goes through those movements, there is a predictable carpal response and there is a predictable carpal alignment of the proximal row and the carpal row and the relationship of the proximal row to the carpal row and the relationship of the proximal row of carpals to the radius and ulna also for that matter. So. When there's damage or injury to the carpal ligaments, the wrist is unable to maintain its normal alignment. And this is the, the cause and the source of symptoms that examinees will describe to you. So common causes of carpal instability include trauma. And uh, that's the one that we're gonna be concerned with as qualified medical evaluators. Also common in inflammatory arthritis. And as we go through our discussion today, I'll highlight which of the uh, carpal instability patterns can be caused by arthritis. Also infections and or congenital pathology, which renders the wrists more or less stable or unstable. Okay, well, so that's out of the uh, journal Hand Clinician. Let's see what the AMA guides uh, have to say about carpal instability. Okay, so the AMA guides, uh, this is a quote from the AMA guides. The AMA guides are quite brief in their discussion of uh, carpal instability. And uh, I have here for us uh, the entirety of what is printed in the AMA guides regarding uh, these conditions. And the AMA guides are uh, illustrative in at least one aspect in classifying carpal instabilities. You see, there's many different classification systems that have been described to describe and classify the severity levels of these different type of uh, ligamentous injuries to the wrist. Well, the AMA guides us seems to settle on one particular of those types of classification systems. And so we're gonna tailor the remainder of this program according to the descriptions and classifications that are used uh, by the AMA guides. So according to the AMA guides, they tell us, uh, and this is out of section 16.7, the other disorders section of uh, chapter 16. They tell us that uh, here in the AMA guides, carpal instability patterns are classified as mild, moderate, or severe. And each one of those is gonna have its own uh, permanent impairment rating, mild, moderate, severe, small, medium, and larger permanent impairment ratings. And those uh, describe uh, increasing severity of symptoms, increasing uh, impact on activities of daily living, and increasing laxity and instability uh, of the wrist, of the carpus, okay? Now, these classifications are usually based on the x-ray findings 
and it listed in table 1625 and we'll go over those and they tell us that even in the case where x-ray findings are normal a mild carpal instability exists when a ligament tear has been diagnosed by arthrogram by arthroscopy or MRI even though the static x-ray findings may be normal so here the AMA guys is quite generous in providing for a permanent impairment rating of mild instability for examinees who have no none of the characteristic uh, carpal instability findings on static x-rays but who have evidence on MRI or arthroscopy or even arthrogram that there is indeed a bona fide ligament tear. So these examinees uh, get credit uh, and consideration for mild instability. Now, this is important. They tell us that certain individuals may have wrist pain and loss of strength related to a dynamic or non-dissociative, that's a key word, non-dissociative, carpal instability that cannot be measured by changes of angles on static Rankinograms. So this is another group that the AMA guys is going to provide for permanent impairment, uh, for a permanent impairment rating, even when the static Rankinograms uh, are otherwise normal. And they tell us that symptoms of such a non-dissociative wrist instability would include painful clicking and clunking with activities of daily living. And the painful clicking and clunking is nothing more than an outward manifestation of the wrist being un unable to maintain its normal alignment under physiologic loads during activities of daily living. So they describe this uh, classification of carpal instability as non-dissociative. Well, if there's a non-dissociative type of wrist instability, there must therefore also be a dissociative type of wrist instability and so let's go into the definitions and uh, further details uh, about these two terms and these two types of wrist instability syndromes so the classification systems that are in current and popular use to describe these wrist injuries have as their common purpose to describe the relationships within the carpal bones and also and in between the carpal bones. So these various classification systems will give us information by their very description as to what type of injury we're dealing with. Are we dealing with an injury within the carpal row, such as within the proximal carpal row or from within the distal carpal row, or are we dealing with injuries that cross and span carpal rows, such as an injury that spans the proximal row into the distal row, or also injuries that um, span the, dis the distance and the gap between the distal radius and ulna and the proximal row of carpal bones. And as we're going to see, not only do we have these two different types of carpal row injuries, we also have injuries, more severe injuries, that involve both types of injury, not only injury within rows of carpal bones, but also between rows of carpal bones and between the uh, distal radius and ulna. Okay, so uh, the AMA guides is focused primarily on what they refer to as dissociative and non-dissociative types of carpal instability. So a dissociative type of carpal instability occurs when intrinsic ligament injuries, intrinsic ligament injuries, intrinsic ligaments are sometimes also referred to as interosseous ligaments. These are interosseous uh, ligaments that go between each of the individual carpal bones to either an adjacent or a neighboring carpal bone, either generally within the same row of carpal bones, these intrinsic ligaments. So it occurs when there's an intrinsic ligament injury and, and therefore there's a disruption of bones from the same carpal row, whether that be the uh, proximal carpal row or the distal carpal row. So these are injuries that are referred to as intra, intra carpal injuries. Well, the opposite of intra would be inter -carpal 
carpal injuries, and that describes the non-dissociative carpal instability pattern. This is when you have injuries to extrinsic ligaments, extrinsic ligaments now that are spanning rows of carpus, that are spanning the distal radio ulnar joint into the proximal row of carpal bones, that are spanning from the proximal row of carpal bones to the distal row of carpal bones, okay, intercarpal ligaments. Occurs when injuries to extrinsic ligaments wherein carpal bones of the same row remain linked. In other words, there's no injury of the dissociative type, but there exists dysfunction between the proximal and distal row or between the distal radius and the proximal row of carpal bones. And the AMA guides uh, is going to provide for permanent impairment ratings for each of these uh, different types. There's going to be specific permanent impairment ratings and descriptions for uh, dissociative types of carpal instability and the AMA guides as they already alluded to in their prior description are going to provide also a permanent impairment rating for these non dissociative types of carpal instability patterns okay so let's take a look uh, at those so to help our understanding of these dissociative and non dissociative patterns of carpal instability Let's just take a quick uh, pit stop and refresh our memory on uh, some of the anatomy involved. So here on the left in this picture here, we have the dorsal surface, dorsal surface of the right hand. And then over here on the left side of our photo, uh, we have the volar surface also of the right hand. So let's start over here on the left on the dorsal surface. Uh, of the right hand. Important for our understanding of at least what the AMA guides describe in terms of uh, carpal instability patterns is going to be involved here with the distal radius and ulna and its articulation with the proximal row of carpal bones. We're also going to be concerned about the relationship between the bones within the same carpal row. So here is the proximal row of carpal bones right through here. Uh, encompassing the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, and then on the bottom side, which you cannot see from here, is also the pisiform. So those make up the proximal row of carpal bones. The distal row of carpal bones would be the hamate, the capitate, the trapezoid, and the trapezium. This group right through here. So with the uh, dissociative type of injuries, at least described in the AMA guides, we're going to be concerned with disruption of ligaments in this articulation and also in this articulation. With the non-dissociative types of uh, uh, carpal instability patterns, the AMA guides uh, are going to describe at least an instability pattern here involving this articulation. And then we'll also present, uh, just for your own edification and knowledge, uh, an instability pattern affecting these articulations in and around the capitate bone. Okay, so that is the uh, dorsal surface. Notice on the volar surface, take notice of these white aspects here on each of the carpal bones. Those represent the articular cartilages, articular surfaces on the carpal bones. And you can notice that these articular surfaces uh, form quite a jigsaw puzzle of uh, articulations. And it's because of the unique angles and the unique uh, facet orientations of these articulations that the carpus uh, has predictable and repeatable movement patterns as it goes through its uh, typical ranges of motion. Well, under loading, any alteration in normal movement patterns is quickly exploited and quickly uh, manifests as pain and as uh, various mechanical <coughs> symptoms such as clicking, clunking, and loss of strength. <coughs> Here on the volar surface of the uh, right hand, notice now that we also have the appearance of the pisiform here, articulating with the triquetrum bone here. And so injury here on this aspect of the hand would involve injury to the volar carpal ligaments, whereas injury on uh, this surface of the hand would involve injury to the dorsal uh, 
carpal ligaments. Of course, then there are also uh, peripherally oriented ligaments as well. So injury to any and all of these ligaments uh, can result in carpal instability patterns. And the AMA guides focuses on this articulation, these articulations, and then also these articulations. Okay? And amongst all those articulations gives us the entirety of the types of instability patterns classified as dissociative and non-dissociative instability patterns. Okay? So let's take a closer look. Okay, so here we have an image that uh, involves the extrinsic wrist ligaments. Here the left side uh, is again the dorsal surface of the right hand. This is the palmar or volar surface of the right hand. And notice that uh, we have a crisscrossing a network of extrinsic ligaments that span the distances not only to adjacent carpal bones, but also across carpal bones into more distal articulations as well. So this is a crisscrossing pattern that serves to stabilize and reinforce each of these articulations as well as adjacent articulations. And then if we were to dissect away these extrinsic ligaments here, then we would get into the intrinsic and interosseous ligaments between each of the individual carpal bones. So with the uh, non-dissociative types of carpal instability patterns, we're most focused with extrinsic lig uh, ligament injury. And with the dissociative patterns of carpal instability, we're concerned with intrinsic ligament injury. Okay, so here we have uh, table 1625 from the AMA guides. And this table is entitled Upper Extremity Impairment Due to Carpal Instability Patterns. And we already said and stated that the AMA guides is describing two types of patterns, the dissociative and the non-dissociative instability pattern. Well, here in this uh, table, the AMA guides provide four permanent impairment ratings for some of the different types of dissociative instability patterns and also of the non-dissociative instability patterns. So as we go down these descriptions here, let me ask you, uh, does a permanent impairment rating due to alterations in the radiolunate angle, does that qualify as a dissociative or a non-dissociative instability pattern? Well, that's a trick question because in this particular case, uh, changes in the radio lute angle describe alterations in the relationship between the radius bone and its adjacent ulna bone. So because that crosses the uh, radio, radiocarpal articulation, this can be thought of as a non-dissociative pattern. But also uh, intracarpal injury, such as injury, uh, in the ligaments between the scaphoid and the lunate bone can cause an alteration in the normal anatomic positioning of the lunate bone and can also result in changes in the radiolunate angle. So changes in the radiolunate angle qualifies as both a dissociative and a non-dissociative type of instability pattern. Uh, changes in the scapholunate angle describes a dissociative type of instability pattern because that involves injury to the scapholunate ligament, which is an intracarpal ligament. Changes in the scapholunate gap, again, are a dissociative uh, instability pattern uh, determined by measurement of the spacing between the scaphoid and the lunate bone. Because with injuries to the scapholunate ligament, the scaphoid and the lunate bone can uh, start to uh, drift away from each other, especially during loading and especially during movement. Uh, Triquitrolunate step-off measurements are used to assess dissociative instability pattern due to disruption of the triquitrolunate ligament that holds those two adjacent bones together. And then finally, uh, the AMA guides provide for permanent impairment rating for an ulnar translation instability pattern, where if this is the distal radius and this is the articulation on the head of the distal radius, 
the carpus as an entirety, meaning the whole hand, the carpus and the hand, can move up or down the surface of that radius articulation. And with significant misalignment off of uh, the, the distal radius, uh, the AMA guides provide for increasing level uh, of permanent impairment rating. Okay, so table 1625 is quite interesting. It provides for uh, permanent impairment ratings for both of some of, not all of, some of, the common non-dissociative instability patterns and also for a couple of the uh, non-dissociative instability patterns. Okay, so that's how uh, the AMA guides represents uh, these different classifications of instability patterns. Okay, so let's go into some greater detail about some of the different types of dissociative carpal instability patterns and also a couple of types of the non-dissociative carpal instability patterns. So remember, with the dissociative instability pattern, this is due to disruptions of the bonds, the ligamentous bonds, between bones of the same carpal row. That could be either the proximal carpal row or the distal carpal row. Now we're going to talk about uh, three types of dissociative instability patterns, two of which are represented in the AMA guides, and one of which is just illustrative for your own uh, edification purposes, but also uh, instructive and illustrative of carpal instability concepts in general. <clears throat> okay, so the first one uh, we want to talk about is known as scaphalunate dissociation. Now, this is one of the more commonly occurring carpal instability patterns. And the AMA guides provide for us two opportunities, two different measuring uh, systems or procedures for determining the presence of scaphalunate dissociation. So this involves injury to the scaphalunate interosseous intrinsic ligament. And then also, to a lesser extent, can also involve some of the extrinsic capsular ligaments as well in those more severe uh, wrist injuries. So the uh, scaphalunate ligament has a couple of different anatomic parts. The thicker dorsal scaphalunate ligament functions as a restraint to distraction, torsion, and translation. Whereas the thinner volar scaphalunate ligament contributes to rotational stability. Now, this uh, instability pattern may progress to rotatory subluxation of the scaphoid when the ligaments secured to both ends of the scaphoid have failed. So, this is proximal scaphalunate ligament and distal scaphalunate ligaments. When they have failed, this causes the scaphoid to collapse into a position of flexion and pronation, flexion and pronation. And this can be uh, detected on physical examination. So this illustrates the principle that these interosseous ligaments are necessary for maintaining the anatomic con congruity between the adjacent carpal bones. And because of the sizes and shapes and multiple articulating facets of these bones, Absent this uh, ligamentous restraint, these bones have the capacity to shift, to sublux, and even to dislocate as the carpus goes through its normal movement arcs. And this is the source of the examinee's symptoms, and these subluxations and misalignments can be detected on physical examination procedures. The AMA guides uh, tell us that these misalignments can also be determined by radiographic measurements, and we'll go into uh, both of those. Okay, with scaphalunate dissociation, the typical mechanism of injury involves a hyperextended wrist, an ulnar deviation with sudden and unexpected loading, and of course here we're talking about uh, a fall on an outstretched hand, such as uh, slipping off a stair, slipping off of a curb, or un other unexpected fall onto the hand. Well, this causes the proximal pole, the proximal pole of the scaphoid to displace posteriorly while the distal pole displaces anteriorly. 
and examinees will report that they have a popping, a clicking, a catching, or a clunking sensation in the wrist, and pain, and also clicking, clunking, with loading activities. By physical exam, the examinee will uh, report tenderness at the dorsal scapholuna interval, and they'll have pain with both wrist extension and also with radial deviation. Now, the provocative maneuver uh, to test for scapholuna dissociation is known as the Watson test, also known as the scaphoid shift test. <clears throat> so, with the scaphoid shift test, it's important to know some of the normal mechanics uh, of the proximal row of carpal bones. The proximal row of carpal bones moves as a group, as a group, we're talking scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, and uh, pisiform, moves as a group into flexion as the wrist moves into radial deviation, and then the movement of the carpal bones as a group reverses in extension as the uh, wrist goes in ulnar deviation. So flexion is radial deviation, extension is ulnar deviation. So with the scaphoid shift test, the examiner applies pressure to the scaphoid tuberosity, scaphoid tuberosity, which is on the volar anterior aspect uh, of the wrist, as the wrist is moved by the examiner <coughs> from ulnar to radial deviation. Okay, so we would expect the carpus to want to flex in moving from the extended position of ulnar deviation through radial deviation. If there's disruption in the scapholuna interosseous ligament, the proximal pole of the scaphoid, the proximal pole, most close to the radius, that is, will sublux dorsally relative to the radius, causing pain on the dorsal radial aspect of the, wrist, of the wrist. And as pressure is released, there will be a dramatic clunk as the scaphoid falls back into its normal position of neutrality or into wrist flexion as the examiner releases his thumb pressure on the scaphoid tuberosity. Okay, so let's take a look at how this uh, appears anatomically. Okay, so here we have some diagrams to uh, depict the scaphoid shift test. This is uh, the volar aspect of the wrist. This is the dorsal aspect of the wrist. And this is the scaphoid bone here. Well, here's the scaphoid tuberosity. So you, the examiner, apply backward dorsal pressure to the scaphoid tuberosity. Now, when the scaphoid, scapholunate ligament is intact and without examiner pressure, the scaphoid is going to want to rotate into flexion this way as the wrist is moved from ulnar to radial deviation. It's going to want to move into flexion. And that flexed position of the normal scaphoid is depicted by this outline here. So the scaphoid bone simply rotates about an axis located right about here in the center of the bottom half of this peanut-shaped peanut bone. Well, if there's disruption in the scapholuna interosseous ligament, and as the examiner prevents the forward flexion of this entire scaphoid bone by his applied pressure here, see this applied pressure prevents this scaphoid bone from rotating and flexing, well, the bone has no option but to slip out the back and out the bottom due to laxity in the ligamentous structures between the lunate and the scaphoid bone. Here's the scaphoid bone. The lunate bone would be on the other side. So this, uh, this scaphoid bone escapes and subluxes dorsally due to loss of its normal restraint. And this sublux position is indicated by this outline here. And notice the difference in the positions of the two outlines. This one is lying in, along an axis nearly long, uh, horizontal, and this one is lying on an axis more oblique oriented with dorsal subluxation. Okay, and here's the same diagram, but uh, here on the opposite hand. 
the examiner applies pressure here on the distal or I'm sorry the scaphoid tuberosity that examiner pressure is going to prevent the scaphoid from flexing as the wrist moves from ul ulnar to radial deviation and as a result the proximal pole of the scaphoid subluxes dorsally due to lack of ligamentous restraint here in the dorsal scapholunate ligament okay so that is the Watson okay so how does this present on uh, standard radiographs well the AMA guides talk about uh, x-ray measurements on uh, plain film x-rays so the two measurements that are described in the AMA guides are the scapholunate gap and also the scapholunate angle also of importance uh, with regard to not only this instability pattern but also uh, some of the non-dissociative instability patterns is changes in the radial lunate angle the radial lunate angle so let's uh, talk about these angles now on a neutral a to p radiograph a scaffold lunate gap greater than five millimeters qualifies for a finding of scaffold lunate instability also on the neutral p to a and specifically on a neutral p to a radiograph with the ulnar aspect of the wrist elevated 15, 10 to 15 degrees, you're going to get your greatest visualization of the scaphoid articulation. And this gapping, this opening due to disruption of the scaphoid interosseous ligament, may be accentuated on loading, which is simulated in radiographs by the clenched fist. By the clenched fist. So asking the examinee to clench the fist. Uh, may accentuate the scaphoid gap. Okay, so in addition to uh, neutral P to A radiographs, we're also going to want to obtain the lateral uh, clenched fist stress radiograph. And uh, the AMA guides tell us exactly how to obtain our measurements uh, of these angles. So in this diagram here, this is the volar aspect of the wrist. This is the dorsal aspect of the wrist. And the AMA guys are going to ask us to draw two angles. One is the radial lunate angle formed by a line extending upward through the axis, central axis of the radius bone. And another line formed by passing through the central aspect of the waist, W-A-I-S-T, of the lunate bone, which is here. And this provides for us this angle here, known as the radiolunate angle. Now notice that this lunate bone is sitting on top of the radius bone, almost in a perpendicular line with the axis uh, through the center of the radius. It's almost a zero degree angle. Well, the AMA guides tell us that this, uh, this lunate bone here, this lunate bone, has a normal range of rotation either clockwise or I'm sorry counterclockwise posterior or clockwise anterior of 0 to 10 degrees in this direction or 0 to 10 degrees in this direction but beyond 10 degrees in either direction it's definitive for uh, loss of uh, carpal stability and do it's it's in uh, x-ray indication of instability at least of the lunate bone relative to the radius bone okay so that's the radio lunate uh, angle and in cases of uh, scaphoid lunate dissociation the radio lunate angle may be greater than 15 degrees and that could be either a positive or a negative 15 degrees in either direction. They describe a scaphoid angle greater than 70 degrees, where normal scaphoid angle is 45 to 60 degrees. And the scaphoid angle is formed by the line through the waist of the lunate, as we previously drew, and then a tangential line across both the proximal and distal poles of the volar scaphoid giving us this angle here.
So normally uh, this is uh, 30 to 60 degrees described by the AMA guides. Another reference uh, describes 35 to 60 degrees as normal. But you can see that as this um, scaphoid bone subluxes more and more and more into flexion, then this angle opens up wider and wider here, giving us larger and larger uh, scapholunate angles. So these angles are very sensitive measures uh, of the anatomy, of the alignment, and of the mechanics uh, of the carpus. Okay, so those are some measurements obtained on, uh, uh, as described by the AMA guides. Okay, let's take a, a look at some of these uh, different uh, lunate uh, positional and instability pattern. Okay, let's take a, another look at uh, some of these angles. Here on our left diagram, we have uh, the uh, scapholunate angle through the waist of the lunate bone and along the axis of the scaphoid bone, forming a normal angle somewhere between 30 and 60 degrees. And you can see that as the scaphoid either moves palmar word or dorsal word, that's going to change the scaphoid angle. So in the AMA guys, they tell us that a scaphoid angle greater than 60 degrees qualifies for a permanent impairment due to uh, scaphoid dissociation. Similarly, here on our left or our middle diagram here, here we have a diagram of the radial lunate angle. So here's the radial line, here's the lunate line. And the radio lunate angle has a normal range of motion of 0 to 10 degrees, with impairment being provided for measurements greater than 15 degrees. But the normal range of values from 0 to 10 degrees, either positive or negative, in the opposite direction. This represents the range of motion of normal position of the lunate bone relative to the radius bone. So when the lunate bone is in a position of a positive angle, positive angle, and the lunate bone is flexed palmar word, we call this a ventral intercalated segmental instability pattern, a visi pattern. When the lunate bone is rotated dorsal word, and we have this negative angle here, negative angle here, that is referred to as a dorsal intercalated segmental instability. That is when the rotation is greater than 10 degrees in either direction. Greater than 10 degrees in either direction qualifies as an instability pattern for which the AMA guides provide for a permanent impairment rating. Okay, so I hope... Uh, I hope that uh, helps you become familiar with some of these angles, some of these drawings, and uh, at least one of the dissociative carpal instability patterns, that is the scaphoid dissociation. Okay, so let's talk now about another of the uh, dissociative types, the lunotriquetral dissociation pattern. Okay, so another one of the dissociative carpal instability patterns that's described by the AMA guides is the lunotriquetral dissociation. Now, with lunotriquetral dissociation, we're moving more towards the ulnar aspect of the hands. So one of the cardinal symptom patterns uh, described by these types of examinees will be ulnar sided hand pain, ulnar sided hand pain, whereas with scaphoid dissociation, the pain is described as more as radial oriented in anatomic location. So here we're talking about ulnar sided hand pain. And we'll take a look at the lunotriquetral ligaments in a minute. But with this type of an injury, this typically results from a fall on an outstretched hand with the wrist in extension and radial deviation. So in order to understand this type of an injury, I just want you to take your hand out in front of you, take your left hand out in front of you, and place the wrist in extension. 
and then move the wrist into radial deviation. Now imagine a fall onto this outstretched hand with the majority of the force and impact of the landing being driven into the hypothenar and ulnar side of the hand. So just palpate the hypothenar eminence over there and also the uh, pisivorm over on the ulnar side of the hand. And you can see that this is going to result in a pinpoint and very specific injury located right around the uh, triquetrum bone which is immediately dorsal to the pisiform bone. So with this injury, the magnitude of force is directed to the hypothenar eminence, causing the pisiform to be driven into the triquetrum, producing dorsal translation of the triquetrum bone relative to the lunate and relative to the scaphoid bone. So the triquetrum bone becomes dissociated from the lunate bone and translates uh, dorsally due to this impact being driven dorsally, while the lunate, which is still stabilized by the scapholunate interosseous ligament and other extrinsic ligaments, uh, stays in place, okay? And we'll look at these uh, ligaments, this ligament in a minute. Uh, these ligaments, I should say these ligaments because uh, there's several components to the uh, lunotriquetral ligament. The palmar aspect of the ligament is the primary stabilizer with the thicker and stronger collagen fibers and more numerous collagen fibers, whereas the dorsal radial triquetral and the scaphal triquetral ligaments are secondary stabilizers. And you'll note just by nature of the naming of these ligaments, these are extrinsic ligaments, not interosseous ligaments within the same row of adjacent carpal bones, but uh, spanning the radial ulnar articulation here, I'm sorry, the radial carpal articulation here, and this one spanning across the lunate bone with a ligament to attach the scaphoid and the triquetrum bone. So, uh, and you can feel the area of the hand where this injury uh, would occur as you're struck on an outstretched hand uh, directly onto the pisiform bone and the hypothenar eminence. This creates a very pinpoint shearing force that causes to separate the triquetrum bone from the lunate bone due to disruption of the luno triquetral ligament. Okay, so here's a couple images of the uh, tr luno triquetral ligament. On the left here, we have the palmar aspect of the left hand. And then on the right, we have the dorsal aspect also of the left hand. So let's take a look at uh, these ligaments here. Here we see the scapholunate ligament. We talked about that in our last session. And connecting the scaphoid and the lunate bone here is that uh, important ligament which with disruption of this ligament, you can see how the scaphoid bone here and the lunate bone here become dissociated from each other. Well, the next row over or the next bone over, we have the lunotriquetral ligament here, making an interosseous connection between the lunate bone here and the triquetrum bone here, which is immediately dorsal to the pisiform bone, which is right here. So on a fall with an outstretched hand with the wrist in extension and radial deviation, the examinee or the patient will be landing with the most uh, majority of the force on the ulnar aspect of the hand. Well, what's going to contact the ground first is the most prominent bone here, which is the pisiform bone. And as the pisiform bone is driven dorsal into the triquetrum bone immediately beneath it, it causes disruption of the lunotriquetral ligament here. So imagine that the uh, triquetrum bone has become dissociated from its adjacent lunate bone here, which is associated with the adjacent scaphoid bone here through the scapholunate ligament. Well, this is going to produce uh, symptoms of weakness, pain, clicking, largely on the ulnar aspect of the hand. And as the proximal row of carpal bones moves throughout its normal motion arc, uh, 
uh, between the extreme of carpal flexion and the extreme of carpal extension, this triquetrum bone here is going to act oddly, strangely, in dissociated fashion with its adjacent, uh, better connected carpal bones, meaning the lunate and the scaphoid bone. Okay, similarly, on the dorsal aspect of the hand, we have the uh, scapholunate ligament here, and then right next to that is the luno triquetral ligament. Now this is the dorsal aspect of the hand and really the primary stabilization of the lunotriquetral articulation comes from the palmar stabilizer here but this shows uh, the more delicate and finer dorsal lunotriquetral ligament here and imagine that this is truly disrupted and the ligament is uh, ruptured in this fashion. This is going to cause a free floating dissociated bone from the nearby connected bones of the scaphoid and the lunate bone and it's going to cause unusual behavior of the triquetrum bone throughout ranges of motion and this is going to be the cause of the examinee's symptoms and recall when we began this discussion we we defined carpal instability the definition of carpal instability is an inability of the carpus to maintain its normal anatomic relationships under loading. <clears throat> so when this carpus becomes loaded, the triquetrum is unable to maintain its anatomic relationship with its adjacent scaphoid and lunate bones. And this is going to be something that we're going to be able to detect on physical examination. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, positive objective findings associated with lunotriquetral dissociation. So because this is an ulnar sided hand injury, your physical examination is going to be focused on the ulnar aspect of the hand. An examination will, re will reveal tenderness over the triquetrum bone and adjacent areas with ulnar deviation of the wrist and added axial compression. It's the axial compression that mimics the mechanism of injury. Uh, in the first place. So axial compression uh, will reproduce the examinee's report of symptoms. And the provocative maneuver associated with the, this injury condition is the lunotriquetral balotment test. The lunotriquetral balotment test. Now this uh, test will be positive when the examinee reports pain and when the examinee exhibits a pain withdrawal reflex when you as the examiner grasps the lunate, the lunate bone between the thumb and index finger of one hand, and this becomes the stabilizing hand to stabilize the lunate bone, while your other thumb and index finger apply a shearing force, dorsal word and palmar word, translating dorsal word and palmar word on the triquetrum bone uh, forcibly and painful shear in other words, a painful apprehension response along with a reproduction of the examinee's symptoms suggests injury to the lunotriquetral ligament. So imagine this uh, physical examination maneuver. With the fingers of one hand, you're going to be able to grab the dorsal aspect of the triquetrum bone with your index finger, and the thumb will grasp the palmar aspect of the pisiform bone. So this is going, you're going to be controlling the piezotriquetral complex, the piezotriquetral complex, and you're going to apply a shearing force backwards and forwards, meaning palmar word and dorsal word, while the lunate bone is firmly stabilized between the fingers of the other hand. So uh, in a bona fide case of lunotriquetral dissociation, this test will be positive. Uh, stress radiographs, meaning uh, uh, radiographs with the fist forcibly flexed will show an increased palmar flexion of the scaphoid and lunate on radial deviation with no change in the position of the triquetrum bone. And this makes sense because the triquetrum bone uh, has become dissociated from both the adjacent uh, lunate and also the scaphoid bone. So as the wrist goes from ulnar deviation to radial deviation, the carpus tends to want to palmar flex. Well, unrestrained 
by the lunotriquetral ligament, the carpus overflexes, meaning the scaphoid and the lunate overflex, and this can be uh, this can be identified on stress radiographs. On lateral radiographs, the scaphoid lunate angle may be less than 30 degrees, uh, which is consistent with a ventral intercalated uh, intersegmental uh, deformity. The lunotriquetral angle will deviate from its mean normal value of 15 degrees to a mean negative 16 degrees, indi indicative of dissociation of the lunate bone from its normal interosseous relationship with the adjacent triquetral bone. Okay, so let's take a look uh, at this physical examination maneuver and uh, these x-ray findings. Okay, here on the left, we have a depiction of the lunotriquetral ballotment test, which shows the examiner with his left hand here, stabilizing the lunate bone with his thumb and index finger on the other side of the wrist. And this requires firm stabilization, firm stabilization in order to uh, create a localized and definite shear stress between these two specific bones requires a firm stabilization with the lunate contact. And then uh, with a dorsal contact on the triquetrum bone here and a ventral contact to the pisiform bone here, the examiner applies a shearing stress dorsalward and palmarward. And with disruption or injury to the lunotriquetral ligament here, this will reproduce the examinee's symptoms, including a painful withdrawal response as the examinee attempts to withdraw his wrist uh, from the painful stimulus. So that's the lunotriquetral ballotment test. And then in terms of x-ray findings for, uh, as described by the AMA guides, the AMA guides do not go into uh, the scaphoid lunate angles and the lunotriquetral angles as related to lunotriquetral dissociation, but they do describe a measurement associated with lunotriquetral uh, dissociation, and that is what they refer to as the um, as the lunotriquetral step off. Lunotriquetral step off. So let's take a look at that here on the right diagram. So what we have here is the dorsal aspect of the right hand. So this is the radius bone here. This is the ulna bone here. Here we have the scaphoid. Here we have the lunate. And just look at the scaphoid lunate articulation and the spacing between the articulation. That would be considered a normal anatomic spacing. Whereas the spacing between the adjacent lunate and triquetrum bones this is the triquetrum here. This is an, an enlarged uh, an enlarged gap. This is an enlarged lunotriquetral step-off distance. The AMA guides begin to provide permanent impairment for a lunotriquetral step-off greater greater than one millimeter. So one millimeter is a tiny tiny distance. This should ordinarily be a tiny, tiny space in here. And you can see that these various other interosseous spaces throughout the wrist are, are tiny, tiny spaces. Well, this is an enhanced, enlarged, and definite gapping as the triquetrum bone is translated ulnarward, sometimes ulnarward. In this case, it's ulnarward based on this radiograph. Sometimes you also see the triquetrum bone translated uh, central word or proximal up towards uh, the uh, ulnocarpal articulation as the triquetrum bone uh, migrates freely away from the scapholunate complex. Okay, so any enlargement of this gap here uh, qualifies according to the AMA guides when it's greater than one millimeter qualifies for a permanent impairment rating. Now, another injury that could create carpal instability, but that is not specifically discussed by the guides, uh, is a scaphoid fracture. Now, even though scaphoid fracture is not described uh, 
particularly by the AMA guides, it can result in a carpal instability pattern that is described in the AMA guides. The AMA guides give us uh, normal values for the scaffold lunar angle beyond which in one direction we have what they refer to as a visi deformity and beyond which in the other direction we have what they call a disi deformity, a dorsal intercalated segmental instability deformity pattern. Well, scaphoid fractures, which tend to heal poorly and tend, sometimes tend to go into a vascular necrosis uh, conditions can result in a deformity of the normal scaphoid morphology. And so with this deformity, this interrupts the normal movement patterns between not only the adjacent carpal bones in the same carpal row, but also between uh, intercarpal rows. So the mechanics are disrupted both uh, intracarpally and also inter carpally. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, scaphoid fracture and take a look at uh, these instability patterns. With the scaphoid fracture, we know that the scaphoid bone is what coordinates motion between the proximal and distal carpal rows. And this, of course, depends on the ability of the scaphoid bone to transfer loads normally. And any deformity or defect in the scaphoid bone would interfere with the normal distribution of loading throughout the carpus, okay? Now, if a scaphoid uh, fracture is untreated or it heals poorly with a non-union or even goes on to an avascular necrosis condition, this leads to the so-called humpback deformity, humpback deformity, which is a radiographic finding. And I'll show you uh, this radiographic finding here in a minute. This leads to a humpback deformity of the scaphoid bone, which often leads to a dissy deformity of the wrist, a dissy deformity of the wrist with the lunate bone in excessive extension relative to the scaphoid bone. So this would create a positive scapholunate angle greater than uh, 15 degrees. No, I'm sorry, greater than 30 degrees. Uh, in the dorsal lunate extension position as a result of the aberrant movement and biomechanical patterns passing through the scaphoid bone. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Okay, so here we have the examinee uh, coming down onto the palmar aspect of his hand and driving uh, the scaphoid bone here up into the radius bone above it, creating a pincher effect and driving the uh, radial styloid process right down through the waist of the scaphoid bone, causing fracture through the waist of the scaphoid bone. Now this fracture line can be anywhere along the substance of the scaphoid bone, but this tends to heal poorly and sometimes this heals either with non-union or either the uh, proximal or the distal fragment may develop avascular necrosis, both of which lead to deformity of the uh, scaphoid bone. So here in this uh, radiograph, we see a fracture with non-union through the mid-waist substance of the scaphoid bone here. And we can tell that these fracture fragments are well corticated with a definite uh, uh, lucency between the adjacent bones indicating that this is an old fracture with a non-union uh, of the proximal and distal aspects of the scaphoid bone. Well, because this scaphoid fracture tends to heal poorly, the scaphoid then develops some type of deformity. And one of the types of deformity that are described in the radiographic literature is the humpback, humpback deformity. So if this represents the normal morphology of the scaphoid bone, this represents either a non-union or an avascular necrosis condition of the scaphoid bone, which then heals with an asymmetric uh, deformity and malformation, uh, perhaps even with a pseudo-articulation between the two fracture fragments. Well, this alteration in the normal morphology of the scaphoid bone interrupts normal interosseous biomechanical patterns 
and can result in a carpal instability pattern. So this uh, diagram above uh, depicts the progression of the development of the humpback deformity. We have first uh, a fracture fragment left untreated with malalignment and poor healing now in the malaligned position and then hypertrophic response with the associated or so-called humpback deformity being created right here. So you can see that, of course, this morphology of this poorly healed bone is dramatically different from the normal morphology of the scaphoid bone, and this disrupts the normal movement mechanics. And here's a close-up uh, CT image of this so-called humpback deformity. This one here has been treated surgically with some pinning process. Well, so this can cause uh, a uh, instability pattern between the scaphoid and the adjacent lunate bone such, this, such that the scapholunate angle uh, is abnormal. Remember that the normal uh, range of values for the scapholunate angle is 30 to 60 degrees with the lunate bone being in an excess extension qualifying as a dissy deformity whereas the adjacent lunate bone in a flexion deformity uh, qualifies as a visi deformity, and the humpback deformity is more associated with the dorsal uh, intercalated segmental instability pattern with the lunate bone, which is not shown in either of these diagrams, but the lunate bone assumes an excessive extension angle greater than 60 degrees. So even though scaphoid fracture is not described uh, in the AMA guides, it can result in an instability pattern, which you can determine through your x-ray analysis uh, as you scan the x-rays for any of these possible carpal instability patterns. So the examinee's history could be uh, consistent with a fall on an outstretched hand, and that could lead to a, a scaphoid fracture, which you may or may not be able to detect on your radiographic uh, findings. In other words, there may or may not be a humpback deformity. But the key finding is the increased scapholunate angle greater than 60 degrees in an extension direction, which the AMA guides clearly describe as a dissy deformity and for which the AMA guides clearly provide uh, a permanent impairment rating for changes in the scapholunate angle. Okay, so doctors, I hope that helps you. Uh, that uh, was a discussion of the dissociative types of carpal instability patterns that are described in the AMA guides. And in the literature, there are several different classification systems uh, associated with describing the carpal instability patterns that have been discovered uh, throughout the years by clinicians and researchers. Well, the AMA guides uh, seems to settle on the classification pattern of the dissociative versus the non-dissociative uh, instability patterns. This is the particular nomenclature that they have uh, settled on. Well, the AMA guides are clear that the dissociative types of instability patterns are discovered by alterations on x-ray images, alterations in scaphoalunate angles, alterations in the lunotriquetral angle, alterations in the lunotriquetral step-off gap, etc. And the AMA guides also provide for a mild, mild carpal instability impairment rating for the non-dissociative types of carpal instability patterns. Now, it's my experience in my own uh, uh, practice of evaluating injured workers that more common than the dissociative type of instability patterns are the non-dissociative type of instability patterns. And the AMA guides do provide for permanent impairment rating, even for those examinees who have normal scaphoalunate angle, who have normal lunotriquetral angle, who have normal uh, lunotriquetral step-off measurements. So in our next session, we're going to go into the clinical findings of a couple of different types of the common non-dissociative carpal instability patterns so that you can be aware of those patterns and so that you can be aware of the physical examination findings
associated with each of those impairments so that you can provide for a permanent impairment rating for those examinees even when the findings on Rankinograms or radiographs uh, do not ordinarily qualify for a permanent impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides. So uh, look forward to being with you on our very next session as we continue our ongoing discussion of the carpal instability patterns. For now, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter wishing you best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.